I think we can uh, recall quick some of the things that we talked about last class that was in the last 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 lecture. Um, So, all right, so just quick, we're just going to. Sip through if anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand, right? And I'm going to post all the slides, even though we're not going to go through all the slides, but then you have some reference for later on, right? So like uh, everybody's going to work on the lathe. Some people are already working on the lathe. So like uh, you have the headstock, you have the tailstock, you have the carriage. That's what like, uh, moves back and forward here. The carriage moving the Y axis. And you have the hand control here. So, the, so you can actually move in the X axis with your cutter, right? You can adjust the gears in the headstock here. So then there's going to like a, you can actually set the auto feed or the power feed to actually move the Y axis in, in, in a specific rate in relation to the rotation of the, of the, uh, of the chuck, right? So um, we just went through like a quick on the, or we went through like a, in the, when we had the class in there. Right, so the, let's see if there was anything that I missed. So you have the high and low. High and low, we only switch when it's, when the machine is not running. And then the speed, we can change when it's running. This is actually to tell the both the the um, the the auto feed and the and the power screw to turn on. If this is not selected, the auto feed's not going to work. You know because you have to have that, that selected either, either going forward or reverse. Like I usually they have reverse because like sometimes when 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 people are treading. I, I cut treads going this way. And then I tell it to go back. And then I tell it to cut treads going forward again. You know, so like a, it's kind of a. They don't do like a, I cut treads going that way. And then I move back and then I move back and then I move forward. And then I go that way again. You know. They actually have the machine making the movement for you, not you doing the movement by hand. But like uh, we are not gonna work like that here. But like uh, if you actually Google like uh, how to cut treads on the lathe, there's a chance that like the person is gonna be actually selecting reverse to actually go back. So the machine would actually go forward and back, and then you'll go in again, forward and back, and go in again, forward and back. Right. So we look at the gears inside of the gearbox. Right. And uh, you saw the drawer full of gears. So that's actually so you could match. See here, uh, I don't know if I have a better picture. See how this one on the bottom. It says like a 60 60 use this column 60 40 60 54 use this column 60 57 use that column. So like that's all replacing. Okay, let's see, just change the gear ratio. All right, so um, I show you, I show you guys the follower, right? Like uh, just something to actually give you some uh, resistance on the other end. So when you're cutting, you're not going to push your stock back. And uh, we have two holders. With the uh, with uh, uh, with quick connect, 
and I showed you guys that like all these tools, you would have to set up so like you were cutting at like uh, at center, right? Remember like when we show like uh, what what happens if you don't cut at center, then you're gonna leave something behind or it's not gonna cut correctly. So this this nut here is pretty much what actually sets the center. If you guys have questions when you go to the lab, you can or you can come and ask me. Right. So that's just like a quick step through the lathe. Uh, just if I forgot about to talk about something. So this is just like a, a quick overview of the. Come on. Uh, parts of the lathe. All right, so we have another group that's on the vertical mill. So the quill feed is actually what would lower. We only use that when we're drilling, right? But I said like uh, sometimes I put like a halfway and then I use the quill feed lock. That's this thing here. So we're not working all the way up and we're not working all the way down. We're just kind of in the middle, just so we have some play in case we need to go back. Uh, we have the table locks here, or what they call like a, some uh, locks or dogs. So like a, usually you'd lock whatever axis you you are not moving, right? And that's the same on the on the on the lathe. Like a, if if I'm not moving in a specific axis, I lock that one just because like a, otherwise the metal doesn't want to be cut, you know. So it's gonna kind of like a push me back, you know. So it's gonna give you a difference like when you're cutting. So uh, so we have the draw bar from coming from the top. The draw bar pulls whatever I have here as a as a tool holder, right? All the tool holders um, see all the tool holders, they have a a treaded like a, some treads here on the back that the that the uh, that the draw bar is going to connect to, and then it's going to pull it in and see how they all have this uh, taper here. That taper is actually what, what's going to match whatever is inside of the quill, inside of like a, on the on the head, right? If you can zoom in. Let's see, how do you zoom on a There's a zoom feature on Windows, right? Oh no, but like a, there's one that I can just like a zoom in like a, it's like a, a magnifier. Sitting like a package. Hmm. Oops. So see, your tool holder is gonna go in there. And there's a female taper in there that matches to so like a inside of this guy here. You have the female of that taper. And then the tool holder has the taper here. So like when the draw bar comes from all the way up here, screws it in, it pulls it together. And then it just locks in place, right? That's all like a, what attached or detached or something. Oop. So one thing that we did, oh yeah, that's good. It's good that I remember this. Uh, now how do I get out? Right. So let's go back to the lathe. It's good that you guys like uh, point that out to me because I would forget it otherwise. Uh, so on the tailstock, On the tailstock here, have you guys like that? So like, uh, who 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 was on the lathe? One, two, three, All right? So like, uh, did it, the did Carico like uh tell you guys to replace whatever was connected on the tailstock there? So whatever you have here, so like I see like a 
this tube actually is what actually moves back and forth, right? It has the all the ratings for uh, how much you're moving forward. But whatever you're going to put in here, so this is a dead center, for example, but like you can put a live center, you can put like a, like a chuck. It's kind of the same, like a, it has, uh, so this piece here has a taper on the, on the other end. And inside of that piece, you have the same female taper. So like a, on our machine, this is a size MT4. So like a, whatever, whatever attachment you buy that has an MT4, you go like a, and actually it's so perfect that they would just like go. And then the only way for you to pull it out, how do you guys pull it out? Uh, you have to pull this guy all the way back. Because there's a draw bar here at the center that as soon as you bring this all the way in, imagine when you get here, this draw bar is going to hit the back of this thing, it's going to speed it out, right? So the only way to take that off is you bring your, you bring your kill stock back. And then it's gonna the draw bar is gonna hit the center and then it's gonna come out. And then you, and then you have to move forward so you can put the next thing in. Otherwise, the draw bar is in there. You're gonna be hitting the draw bar in there. Right. But that's uh so it's kind of like a it's it's a similar effect with the with the draw bar coming from the top, right? Like uh do you know like like a you you whoever's on the mill notice that like a you actually you you can screw the, the draw bar all the way up and pull it out, and your chuck is still stuck in there, right? And then you come and you give like a little, and then it comes down, right? Just because like uh those parts are so they they match perfectly that like uh you have you actually have to have to push it out, otherwise it's not gonna disconnect. Good. So let's see. That was the vertical mill. And uh, for all these machine tools, and that's that's gonna be the same with the with the uh, with the bed saw. Uh, we have to make sure our 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 work is being held correctly, right? The piece, our work piece, is being held correctly. Otherwise, like we can't guarantee anything, right? So um, we have to guarantee that that your that your stock is secured, and we have to guarantee that that also it's secured on something that's actually true or, or lined up, right? If my if my uh, vise is all crooked, like a uh, my piece that's going to be there, it's not going to be straight, you know. So you have to guarantee the first one is true, and then the second one, then the second one is going to be true. You know, so we already talking about this. Uh, Trucks are for drill bits. Collets are for end mills, right? Don't don't mess that up. All right, and then. Usually we have a little class on. Uh, I actually try to uh, zip through to you, like uh, when you're were towards the end of the class. The time, oops. All right. So like uh, when we're treading, our cutting tool has a 60 degree angle, right? So one thing that we have to guarantee, so this is how we start, right? This is our stock. When it has no treads, our tool has this shape, right? 
So I'm gonna put it out here. 60 degrees. I have to make sure that this angle is actually 60 degrees, see? Because if this is 60, this is gonna be 30. And this is gonna be 30, and that's gonna be 60. The other angle that we have to guarantee is that, so this is the cutting tool, right? And we have the holder. And the holder is connected to the cross compound. That thing that we turn around and we make it, and we move at an angle. Do, do you guys remember that like that? We move at an angle a few times or three times. And so like go angle, 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 and then we'll go one forward, right? Do you guys remember that? So for those who weren't on the lay, right now it's kind of not gonna make sense, but for those who are on the lay, like I said, oh yeah. So if we don't adjust our cross compound to be at the right angle, when we cut at an angle, even if this is actually like that, when we move forward, we might move forward at the wrong angle. So like, a, let's say instead of going at, at 30 degrees to go like this, we're going at, let's say 15 degrees. One side, so it's going to be kind of like this. One angle is going to be different than the other one. Which one's going to be? Because one side is actually how you move at an angle. And then when you go forward, you're going to cut only the back side. So that side is going to be. Uh, so that side is going to be 30, uh, 30 and the other side is going to be 15. So the you are going to end up with a with transfer like this. See, one angle is different than the other one. It's easier to see if, if you make a mistake, then you're gonna see, ah, so okay. that's what happened. But like a, when you're adjusting the cross compound, like a, the rest is like this, right? Then you move at an angle, and this is actually mounted on something, and this is actually on a, on a graded thing that has like a whatever angle you are at. So that's the one that we have to adjust to make sure we're going at the right aim. Right. That's something that I got. Like a most likely character didn't set it up with you guys because like I usually adjust before you guys get there. So you're not gonna make a mistake. Right? But like yeah, all the treads they have this standard angle that's 60. Right? What what would change is How far the treads are, and how far the treads are has a relation with how deep they are. So this one, so depth is actually a function of the pitch, right? And at the end, we we actually uh, filed the top of our treads, that'll be the crest, 
because the crest is actually flattened. See? So everything already has a standard. So U and C is unified course, U and F is unified fine, and then you have the metric. So usually we'll be looking at what's the pitch. So like, for example, if it's an M2, M2 is the diameter, and you'd have to see what's the pitch that you wanna, or what's the distance between the treads, right? So usually when you're making a, let's say, I have a, like, I can do any tread. Which one are you going to pick? I don't know. You just look at the, the one bolt that you have and you make the other side. You know, like you try to buy, oh, I have a, or I have this rod that's like a half an inch. What is the screw that will be the closest to half an inch? You know what I mean? Then you just like a come and pick one here, one standard, and then you just go for it. So we can measure how many threads per inch. Like we have this gauge out there in the lab. Or we can just like a measure the distance of the treads and then you, and then you'll find the same number. That's just like a, a jig or a tool that makes our life easier. Right? So uh when we actually, when we are tapping, I said that's the problem that we got into like a last class where we were like a drilling for tapping. Was it that we were trying to find like which, uh, which drill we would use so we would tap like a three quarters, right? We actually have to account. So let's say that we are drilling here. The exercise there is a three quarter 10. Right? That's the. So we're going to do a three quarter 10 in here. So if we think three quarter, like a, and a, the guys that are on the, on the vertical mill or on the, on the lathe are doing the, the other side. So how did you guys do on the, the guys that are treading on the, on the vertical mill, on the, the guys that are treading on the lathe, what did you guys do? You, you guys did like a, Three quarters like this, right? It was actually seven hundred fifty thousands to seven hundred forty-five thousands before we start trading, right? That was the the target. So, if I drill three quarters here, this guy's just gonna go, right? So whatever hole we have to put it here before we tap. Is gonna have to only be whatever is what I call the core, just the center here with no trends. We know how to calculate the tread depth because it's a it's a function of the pitch. So then you can get to what's the drill size before you, and then you're gonna tap. The, the easiest way to know is if you look at the tap itself, the tap is a tool to actually cut treads. So it's just a tool, you put it in the hole, you turn around, and then you're going to start cutting the treads, right? If this, doesn't go in the hole, you're not going to get treads, you know? If your hole is this big, this tool doesn't even get in there. So the easiest way that I find is, I just come in here and I measure with my caliper, what's my minimum, my minimum, like the smallest hole that I can have. So this guy will be able to go in so I can get treads. So that's what we did, right? We just measured and see like a, what would be, what would be uh, 
um, what will be like a, a drill bit that will be in between here, between three pores and whatever is this diameter. And then that's the one that we use. So that's the, so this is what I said. If this is the tap. So see if, if my hole is this big, that tap doesn't get in there. So now I'm going to cut treads. If my hole is this big, I'm not going to cut, cut treads either because it's just going to go in. So I have to find something that's a hole that's in between these two so you can actually cut treads. So we can actually create our, our treads the way that we want. I think I talked to the guys when we were talking about treads there. You can make a loose fit. You can make a very tight fit. It's up to like a you and uh, the application that are going to do. Right. So usually in our, like for mortals, you know, like regular people, we are only looking at this, right? But then like uh, the further into the rabbit hole you go, you're going to actually have a lot more specifications, you know, like for example, at Bobcat, they have a guy that's like, a, he's uh, specialized in like a, a bolted parts. The guy most likely have been working with bolts for like a 30 years, you know, so like a, for him, like a, this is just the beginning of the story, you know, he would have to look at a lot more things. But like a, usually we would actually stay in this area. And then ask like a, you guys are going to go into calculations of like a, how, you know, is this going to hold together? How many bows I'm going to put here? Then they're going to say, oh, I need a grade five boat. And I need the boat to be this, like this, and like that, you know. What matter was the material of the boat, you know, like all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, it can get pretty extensive in that area. But just so you see, like that, the, what, what we see here is just the beginning, you know. Seven. All right. If you guys have questions, you can stop me. I know I'm trying to plow through, but. All right, because the next thing that we're going to talk about is the saw. You know, I don't like animation at all, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to do this. So instead of talking like a, about like a, just a hex saw, we're just going to talk about like a saw in general. And that, that's going to apply to anything, you know, and then we're, we're, we're going to show many different kinds of like a, Cutters, because usually the, the 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 fundamentals for one tooth of the saw is the same for one cutter of the mill. That's the same for one one sand that's glued here. You know, it's just like a how many you have, how it's rotating. That's going to change things. But like a, otherwise, the idea is the same for everything. So we were talking about like a so like pitch is the distance between the the crest or or between the tread uh, or or between the the between the between the teeth, but different than the bolt is actually very common that the pitch is variable on, on the saw. Why is that? So like, uh, usually all these things, they have a reason. Like uh, for us up until now, when we, when, when we get one like this, like, it's like, uh, why would we, why would I pick this one? Let's say 
to make it easier on the, you guys choosing. So if we look at this two blades, they're both for two different materials. How can you tell that? The bigger ones for softer material with the, the bigger, wider depths. And the smaller one is actually for harder materials, right? Because like a, this one, I want to actually take very little amount of material per movement, right? Why? Otherwise, I'll break my saw or break my blade or, you know, it's just too hard to cut the metal. Compared to like when I'm cutting wood, wood is very soft. Like I can just like a, put all, all these teeth in there and say, you know, so like, a, so usually when you're looking at blades, blades, you can go there and there's going to be a whole shelf full of different blades. You know, it's like a, going to the supermarket and picking like, I don't know, basket. You can get like a, all different kinds of stuff. So like, a, and, e and each would actually uh, have and the specific thing, and as I said before, I want you guys to understand more than memorize. You know? So, um, so I said that the pitch, so the the depth is a function of pitch, right? So the how deep it is. has a relation to the distance. See, the idea is the same. It doesn't matter if it's the. If it's the. Bolt or blade, you know, so like a, the idea is the same. So I expect when I have. More teeth. For my thread depth to be smaller. Right. So, so pitch is the most important thing when selecting the blade, because actually the pitch already tells what's the depth, right? And then the material is what's gonna guide you to see what's the pitch, right? And also, what's the thickness of the material, right? Because imagine like if my material is very thin, I want like a smaller teeth, otherwise I'm just going to rip through it, you know, just breaking some, or shearing like a, instead of just like a, like a cutting material, right? And uh, we would actually try to get as coarse of a blade as possible. Why is that? Because the, the, the fish, Besides ruling what's the depth and how fast we're going to remove material, this clears between the teeth also help us a lot. So that's what what we're going to see when you start having teeth that are like this. Like for example, this one, the shape is like this. So I would want a gap in here. So whatever material I, material I removed, I can discard in this gap. If, if my teeth are like this, there is a chance that it's going to collect stuff in there. Okay. So we're going to go to the coarser as coarse as possible. Why? It's just so material doesn't get caught on it. So that's one of the variables, right? It's what's it's how many teeth per inch. What's the pitch that I have, right? Now 
we're going to talk about something that's like, ah, I actually never heard about this before getting here, you know. I, I imagine it's going to be new to you too, and uh, it, it's going to be a whole new world about this kind of stuff. Um, so when you look at the teeth on a blade, it's very unlikely that they're lined up. So, for example, if you read here, Raker, one tooth to the left, one tooth to the right, and one tooth in the middle. How come? Wavy, three teeth to the left, three teeth to the right. Straight, one tooth to the left, and one tooth to the right. There's not a single one that says, one tooth after the other, you know, just like that, in a straight line, which I never thought this was even possible. But it is what it is. So let's see if I can. Uh... Trying to change my camera. I'm going to try to pick, I think it's going to pick up my hand. So which one do you guys think that this one is? Can you see that there are three teeth to one side and three teeth to the other side and teeth back and forth? So how come? Like this is actually the most standard like a blade that we ever buy and i never noticed that like a, they are actually not one behind the other one. Because we want um oops, sorry. Because well, well no, I don't want to see me. So when I'm removing material, imagine that these three teeth are going to collect some, some material here. And then now when I'm done with it, I'm going to start So this is just the distance between the teeth, right? Like a three to the left, three to the right. If I cut one side first, so this one's going to take this side. After I cut it, it's going to dispose this. And then these three next ones are going to cut that side. See? I had to take less material for a pass. This one only cut this little bit. And then I cut that little bit. See? There's less stress of my cutting. And I take this material, dump, take the material, dump, take this material. It's like there's also some time for this side to cool down before I cut it again. It's the same as adding clearance between teeth, even though this one pretty much has no clearance. It's just like that. By waiting to cut this side again, it's actually the clearance that I get, right? And uh, the next one, the, the raker, one to the left, one to the right, one in the middle, same idea. I just have to take a little bit from here, a little bit from there, a little bit from the middle, right? So let's see. This one will be a raker. I guess I'm coming up later. But like a, see like a, this one, it's a raker. This one is a wavy. And uh, there's one that's just like a straight, it's one to the left and one to the right, which will be, which will be this one. 
right? So that's uh, those are like a different kinds of blade of of like a teeth set. How the teeth are positioned. So can they be positioned so like on a normal hand saw back at home? You'd have one line of metal, and then on the, that one line of metal, you have two here and two here. Yeah, so that's how it's. Okay. Yeah, so like a, on the on this one, you say. So that one, like the whole metal moves. No, no, it's not the metal that moves. So like a, it's like this. So like a, if you look at the blade like this, one teeth is built like this, and so like. One set of teeth is built like this. The other set of teeth is built like this. That makes sense. So like if you look it from here, your tooth is kind of like this. They're not like a, they're not like this. If you look it from the front. It goes from one side of the blade that way. And then the next one goes from this side of the blade that way. See? So like on the on the on that one is difficult to see just because the teeth are so small. But like I when we pick one of this up. Oh, I can see even less. All right. Maybe not. I think we've done the light. Can you guys see here? That's going this way. And that one's going that way. But usually it doesn't extend further than the width of the blade. You just angle. The, the inside part of it is actually angled out. So this is actually how the set is positioned, right? Now we have another variable to make it even more complicated. Um, that is. Oh, so I could, that's, uh, that's an easy one. Shape. On a, on a, on a regular one, we, we don't allow any clearance, but then like a, we usually have a set, right? Three here, three there. So that would be the clearance. Uh, and usually we're not using in a way that we are we're expecting to be hot. Right. You'd want to have more space in between. When you want actually to like that, make sure you take more material. So for example, if I'm cutting something with this teeth here, Imagine that my, that my piece is this big, right? When I come in here, I'm going to lose this much, right? Because I have this gap here, I allow it to actually drop. And then the next one, 
it's going to take that much again. That's when I can actually take a lot of material. Right? Okay. So I don't mind taking a good chunk of material at a time, right? Now, the shape of the tooth, this shape, it's less material than this shape, right? Can you see that like that? Whatever I don't, I don't cut is actually going to go before you through and be cut on the next one. This one, I grab my material on the hook and then they. So that's a much more aggressive cut, which I would expect from softer material. Right? But it's like, a, what about this one? But then this one, we have carbide tips, like a, it's not like a, like those ones. So this is a special blade for cutting metal. So like a, we haven't played with it yet. But like I got it just so like in case we want to cut some like heavy duty stuff, you know. But see like a, that one will be kind of like a, the hook shape. All right, and uh, the other one would be a variable pitch. There is a chance that you're going to have one that's like this. So we have a set of three that they're different. And then another set of three, and then another set of three, and then another set of three. So it's it's actually not uncommon to see something like this. This it, it also relates with the rate of material removal and how hard the material is to be cut. Right? So we so we are not gonna study study in depth all all of this right now. I just want to show you what's out there, and like the more you go into the rabbit hole, you're gonna see more different things like this. You know, it's like a, uh each of you like I might go into like a design, some might go into manufacturing, and like a you might never see this before. Like a you you might never see this again. And there is a chance that they're going to see this every day, you know, so but like that. But everybody has to know that it exists. All right. So if what's interesting that you guys are going to see in the future. Is that like a, every time that we're talking about cutting, usually when you talk about cutting metal, we talk about like a, how many RPMs, you know, so let's say you're using a drill or using on the lane or using on the but the but the the property or the number that we have to look at for cutting metal or for cutting material in general is not given in RPMs. It's given in surface. Heat per minute. So even though we talk about RPMs, usually you're always going to get, oh, this metal I have to cut at 10 surface feet per minute, right? But now I'm using a drill bit that's a quarter inch, so now I should be using this RPM. Usually we, we don't care about it, you know, let's push the drill the hardest, you know, like the trigger, you know, the it's a like a 
But right now, when when we actually look into, okay, I want this $100,000 drill bit to last for 15 hours and not like a five or, or not like a five minutes, you know, just because it's actually doing something really hard. You're going to get to the nitty gritty about like a, okay, what's the very specific, like which coolant I'm using? It's also going to tell like how much, because like a, now we're going to talk about heat. Now we're going to talk about like a material, you know? So like a, and um, in the classes, we're not going to about talk, be talking about like a sawing, but like we're going to cover a lot of that when we talk about cutting on the lathe or cutting on the mill or cutting on the, on the CNC. Especially, so like at this class, everything that you see in this class, it's actually an introduction to what you guys, guys are going to see in a EME 418. That's a month that that's manufacturing processes. So like a, when when you guys get there next year, you guys are going to see yeah, we, like we saw all this like a, in an EME 298, just because like it's the same class, but that one is actually much like a, we are talking about like a, looking at the at the crystal of the metal and getting to the degree of this stuff and then looking at the how we're gonna break them those crystals you know in the or the molecules all right so here like i use of the saw we have to check the blade uh, so this is something that like uh i think for those four on the Weld, welding and we're and uh, and we're doing a project we we were talking about it uh so now that we're talking about this can you see that we're always gonna lose material so imagine that this one you wanted to cut you're gonna cut with this blade you're gonna lose this see You really have to know. I put like a, a straight line here and I want to cut this thing. Oh, do I want to cut to the left or to the right of my line? You know? And especially like when you're when you're uh, putting the layout down, that means like when I'm inscribing on the piece so I can cut it, when I'm tracing, I don't want to trace like this. Imagine that this is my blade. And I and I put a mark like this. Oh, let's cut there. But they're where? You know, I can actually put my, my blade here. I can put my blade there. You want to be specific. So that's why, like when, like a when you go in the shop there, you're gonna find something that's called an inscriber. It's a tool that's like this. It's actually very sharp on one end, and the other end has like a little. You might see. So this actually it scratches the metal. So it's actually only a thin line that's scratched there, right? So usually we would use an, an, an inscriber because now my line is gonna be like this. Oh, I wanna cut it right here. And then my line is gonna be like this. Okay, now we went to the left or to the right of the line. Now it makes sense to talk about left and right, you know. But like, uh, if you just put like a big chunk, like a big, a big line like this, it doesn't mean, like. If you do this, like if you go for an internship and you do this, the guy is gonna say, you know, like, oh, you have no idea of what you're doing, you know. So I, I just want to make sure you guys understand this, you know, um, because like, uh, imagine you design a wheel and then there's a hole for the bolt what if the hole is not where it should be it's actually off by a little bit your whole project doesn't work you know it's not like a up until now i drew a hole it's like a when i was like a installing my uh my uh installing the the microwave in my house. If you look at the microwave that goes on the above the stove, you put the microwave, it mounts on the wall, and then you have two screws that two bolts that come from the top, right? 
So if I if I put a hole here and I put it like this, that's fine. But like a, this would never work on a on the wheel of a car that goes like 100 miles an hour. You know. So like all these things that we do in life, that like a, you know, oh, it's let let's put a bigger hole down. Let's put a bigger hole and a bigger washer. So now I can actually just like a, now I have some play. There's all this guesswork and like a, you know, kind of works is actually gonna, it's not gonna, it's not gonna exist anymore. The more, and the higher end you go, your tolerances are gonna be tighter, you know, depending on the work that you're gonna do. So, and uh, the last one is never use, a new blade on a node cut. Why? Because if this blade is old, it's already going to be kind of worn out. You know? So imagine that now I'm halfway through the cut with the old blade. I'm now going to come in with a new blade. What's the size of the new blade? It's a little bit bigger. So how do you do that? You know, your cuts are kind of go weird. So like a, usually what we would do, we would actually flip it upside down. And then we'll finish the cut. Right. Uh, in case like a, for example, if you're running on like a, a bend saw and then your your blade like a breaks, there's nothing that you can do, you know. So that would be I know that like a, there's a lot of material, like I know a lot of, a lot of like a new terms, but the idea is just to show like a what's all that's out there. And that there is a chance that I'm not gonna remember. But as I said, like uh, the only thing that I, the, the most important thing that I want you guys to understand is when you look at, at like a more teeth per inch, I would say, oh, now if, if I have more teeth per inch, so they're gonna be squishy together. Most likely the depth is gonna be automatically smaller. Most likely, I'm going to use that on something that I am going to extract a little bit of material at a time for some reason because I can't, because I don't want to extract a lot of material at a time. Maybe because it's hard, you know, it's like, you know, see like how one thing automatically leads to the other thing. So you, so, so you don't have to know, like you don't have to memorize. It's, it, it's going to be all about, okay, this is what makes sense, you know, more than, you know, let's memorize it 10 in a, Next semester, you have no idea of like a you know, this stuff, you know. All right. And really quick, five minutes. Let's see if we can jump into the last one. It'll be the grinder. There's a grinder. There's not much to talk about the grinder. Um, besides rules, what you shouldn't do, right? So we never, ever, ever, ever grind on the side of the wheel, right? We always grind on the face of the wheel, unless it's a wheel that's made for cutting for a grinding on the side. Some wheels on the on the so like a, when you look at the at a at a grinding wheel from a from a from an angle grinder, some wheels from the grinding wheel from the angle grinder they're they're made like this, and you can clearly see that this is actually the area that it should be using. You know, so like a. It's each thing is actually for one specific thing because like a the structure, the way that they build the thing is actually so it would actually withstand what they're doing, right? 
if you use the wrong way, there's a chance that you're going to damage the, I would say, the wheel. But once I'm not worried about the cost of the wheel, I'm more worried about like it. Now it can shatter and then it can damage your face. You know, it, like it can hurt you, you or or it can hurt somebody else. You know. So we are always gonna like on the on on the grinder. We're always going to grind on the face, not on the side. Also, we're always going to use the rest. And the rest has to be as close as possible to the wheel. Why? Because if I'm grinding something here and I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to grind like a mango on the end here. As you move up, it's going to try to suck your piece in, see? And uh, it's going to be automatic for us. We're going to try to hold it. And we're going to be sucked in, right? So we don't want this to happen. So we're always going to position our rest the closest we possible to the wheel. We're always going to use the rest because if we try to grind up here, we're going to have to actually secure like a. We already talked about like a holding our workpiece. That's the most important thing. Then we are holding the workpiece. If we use the rest. You pretty much have only to actually move the work piece around. Like who is actually holding me is actually the rest. Right? You guys are gonna see when you guys get there. You know, like uh, when you get to use the grinder on the on the um on the welding station. Right? So when we start the machine, we uh actually when we start any machine, we have to assume that's not working. I give you a multimeter, so I can you measure this. The first thing that you do is actually check if it's working. You know, I I tell you like a go in a you uh, you you're gonna have a, a a an important presentation and you're gonna use that TV. The first thing that you do, I go and plug in the TV, put my computer there, so it works. You know, I'm not gonna say get in there and say you know somebody should have checked it that that's working. You know, because the problem is. Sometimes it's not gonna work, but it's gonna it's like a, there. There are two ways that something's gonna go faulty. One way it's open, and one way it's a short. So like one way it's not gonna work, and not the other way it's not gonna work, but it's gonna explode. You know what I mean? So like a, it can be faulty two different ways. So in this case, we're gonna assume that somebody dropped the wheel, and then there's a crack on the wheel. So the first thing that you do is when you turn on back to the side, you're just going like this. And you, you waited to actually reach like a max speed. And then now if it didn't explode now, it's good. You know. There's another way for us to, to uh, see if the if the wheel is cracked. Uh, but usually or if or if the wheel is damaged. But like uh, usually we don't have the wheel out of place, so we can actually uh, do this test. So uh, this is called a uh, ring test. But like uh, it's very common, for example, here in North Dakota or any of the cold states. But like uh, you have a farm, and then you have a bunch of wheels there. Somebody says, "Oh, can you put the that wheel that was in the barn on the on the grinder to use?" And then you're gonna put it there. It looks good. Doesn't look broken. And then I put it there. You turn on. So uh, that's something that we call the ring test. It's like a, if you hold the wheel and you tap it, it should do like a, a ring sound. If there is a crack, it will give you like a dual sound, like 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 what it is. Like talk. Because the, the crack doesn't allow it to ring, you know, like a doesn't like to resonate. But like a, I can do the ring test. I can do the ring test if I am if my wheel is in there and I'm not gonna take it apart. So that's why we just turn on, step to the side, wait, 
Let me see. Because like all these videos, they have a specific way to be stored. And usually we don't read the manual. So like we just put them in the barn there somewhere, you know, in any way. So uh, the so we always like uh, when we're using the wheel, if somebody actually grinded on the side of the wheel and their head and a chunk comes out, that's when my grinder is going to start like a shaking. It's not a problem with the grinder, it's a problem with the wheels. That, the, the, it's just like a, it's just because my, my weight is actually unbalanced. So there's no way between like a of continuing unless we actually grind down the wheel until we get to whatever chunk we took it from the side of the wheel. Or we just discard the wheel. Some people on the, if you actually go on YouTube, some people they say, you know what? Just find a, the balance, go on the other side and put a hole on the other side. That's not the it's like a smart way of doing things. But like, uh, like uh, the, but that's like a, uh, the way that people, um, uh, sometimes do it. Um, so we have to know. So like a this wheel, a wheel like this, or any of the grinding wheels, it's a, it's actually a bunch of sand or the grit bonded together with a resin or something. Right. So the properties of this holding together have to stay at a specific speed. D max 3,700. There's a chance that the arbor, which is the hole in here, would match with another tool, another tool that we have at home that's not a grinding wheel, that's not a grinder. And you can say, you know what? I can just put it in there and this is the grinder. But now you put yourself in in this condition where you know what if it explodes? You know what I mean. Another one is sometimes people say, you know what, it comes like this. You say, you know, I don't know how this goes in, but like I just put like a just put like any washer in there, and it should work. So all all these wheels they're made to have a flange, and the flange has a specific size. So it put pressure sideways on it in a way that's not going to allow it to break. If I just put the nut in here, there's going to be so much pressure in the center here that it's actually going to break or damage or something. So uh, I know that we're running late. The So I'm gonna show you guys how I, I think I already showed like a people there on the on the on the on the welding station like a how to dress the wheel right so like we're gonna go through that right there and uh, yeah I think that's the pretty much it. so like if you have questions you can let me know but like I usually all these things that we talk about in the lecture we are gonna cover on the on the when we're in the lab. If not, you can come to me or you can come to like any other professors and then they can actually like uh, show you exactly where it is on the equipment there. All right. I'm gonna load all this uh all these uh, presentations that I have on uh, Canvas so you guys can see you guys can have for your record, right? All right, thank you, and I'm sorry for taking this three minutes from you guys.